Amen. Amen. Well, all this beauty in the one place. <laughs> Everybody made in the image of God. Well, that's true, it's true. Okay. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Well, welcome everybody. Um, we'll be doing a kind of a tour of the church. Now, the, the, the church itself was built in 1900, and finished in 1993. And you can see by looking at it, it's built in the old style of churches. And in case you haven't noticed, it's built in the shape of a cross. So, and you can see it more easily when you look up the way. And in case you haven't noticed this either, your own body is cross-shaped. So uh, if you want to be crucified, we can arrange that as well. <laughs> yeah. And we almost have a little cross in the middle of our faces, you know, so. Um, what else about it? Okay, um, wh when we got it first, it was, uh, it was stark white. We've painted it since, and we've added an awful lot of uh, uh, artwork. There's probably over 200 pieces of artwork. Um, I, I'm, I'm saying this next part to just stir it up a little bit. Most of the artwork in here was done by a mere woman. A mere woman. I'm just trying to stir it up. Yeah. yeah. Um, and in case you haven't noticed, the Lord Christ himself was born of a woman. Okay, just, just get it going a bit. Um, the, the, the church itself was uh, paid for nine months after we walked into it. So it was very good. Um, I'm the shepherd and you're the sheep, so it's my job to fleece the flock. <laughs> uh, and, uh, so that, that's what happened. And nobody's name is on anything. We all did it together. There was no special campaigns to uh, reach out to the people who had money. We did it together. And I was so pleased about it. Okay. Um, I'll say some general things about the Bible first. Maybe this will help. Um, it might be easier doing it here. The Old Testament part of the Bible, written, committed to writing in, in the 1800 years before Christ, probably they started to write it down during the times of King David and Solomon. You know, they had uh, scribes at that time. But the Bible existed in oral form, in stories, in the hearts and minds of the people. Uh, the New Testament was written again in that short period of time between the life of Jesus and the next 50 years or so. It was all written down. Now, here's a general rule that, when it comes to the Bible. The New Testament is hidden away in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament is revealed in the New. Now, I'll give you an example, two examples of it, and then it'll make it easier to grasp. Now, however, that's the Old Testament. Now, watch Jesus speaking. A man named Nicodemus came to Jesus at night, and uh, Jesus said to Nicodemus, just as Jonah spent three days in the belly of the earth, belly of the whale, so the Son of Man will spend three days in the belly of the earth, and after three days, rise again. So again, so when it comes to the great stories of the Bible, it's, you don't really ask, did it happen? It's best to say, what does it mean? What does it mean? So Jesus himself teaches us then, um, just as Jonah spent three days in the belly of the big fish, so the Son of Man will spend three days in the belly of the earth and after three days rise again. There you go. There's the Old Testament and the New, the meaning of it. Here's another one. The time of Moses. Um, the name Moses is pronounced Moshe and it means I drew him out of the water. Now, 
Moses was um, Moses led they approximate three million people out of the land of Egypt who knows God knows but they did something that people do a lot they complained a lot they complained about the manna they were sick to death of the manna the, the word manna is like a maybe a food I don't know spun by an insect there's so much of it to feed so many people and when they saw it first they said manna manna what is it what is it so they got sick to death of the manna and they got sick to death I suppose of the wilderness and then it says in the scripture God caused seraph serpents to come out and bite the people so that many of them died okay for their complaining that's a lesson for me no more complaining <laughs> um, and then Moses interceded and he said oh Lord save the people and the same God who told Moses do not make graven images he told him to make a bronze serpent would you make up your mind <laughs> if I not have to have graven images why are you asking me to do one now you can't really see this in here but uh, the rose window up there at the very top there's an image of Moses uh, with a bronze serpent on a pole okay so Moses then made the bronze serpent and whoever looked at the bronze serpent got well now watch this go forward now let's play it forward Jesus said just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert so the son of man must be lifted up from the earth and if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all mankind to myself. So, everything then in, in the Old Testament was fulfilled in the New. This cross, is, it's, uh, with all the grandeur of this church, this cross came out of a dumpster in the city of Coco, Florida. Um, I, we have given it a place of honor in our chapel over here. I'll just tell you the story behind it. Um, there was a bag lady in the city of, of Rockledge, Florida, and she was damaged. She, was, she had been a nurse during World War II. She was very badly damaged uh, in terms of fears and uh, very skittish. Her name was Willie Bayless, and in the heat of the summer, she'd be uh, overdressed with three or four, looks like different pantsuits. And she walked around the city of Coco, uh, picking up bits and pieces of paper and paper cups that the sane people threw out of their cars. So she picked them up. And then she'd bring them down to a dumpster. And again, she was very skittish, frightened. And um, so I respected her space. I, I would bow to her from a distance. and. Um, Anyway, the day came where she, she went down to her dumpster and this cross was in the dumpster. So she climbed into it and got it out and wrapped it up in a piece of industrial plastic. And she walked around the city of Coco and like a demented woman just did something to her mind again. And so some friends of mine stopped her and they said, Willie, what you got there? and they, they peeled back the plastic and they saw this so then they said something now you'll have to excuse her remember this woman is not well in her mind uh, they said uh, to her uh, Willie we'll give this do you remember Father O'Doherty I just left there to come here and she said I do she said he was a nice man that's the part I want you to remember <laughs> She, she was not well, she was not well. Um, so they took it and brought it to me, and uh, so it has a place of honor here. And there's a little plate at the bottom of it, and it says, the new Adam. Okay, like, Adam disobeyed God, Jesus was obedient, even unto death, death upon the cross. Um, Adam blamed his wife, it was the woman you put me with. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Um, Adam ran away from God. The second Adam cried out, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Um, the first Adam, Eve was made from the side of the first Adam. 
Adam's rib. The church, the bride of Christ, was made from the side of the second Adam. Uh, when they came to Jesus, they found he was already dead. So they didn't um, break his legs, but the soldier took a spear and shoved it into his ribs, under his ribs, and the early Christians saw it. Oh, God opened Adam's side, the soldier opened Jesus' side, out came blood and water. You were baptized, water for blood, water for baptism, immersed in the dying and rising of Jesus, blood for the Holy Eucharist. So everything in the Bible is um, paid for. Just before you go, Genesis, creation, the fall, Cain and Abel, Noah's Ark, uh, Abraham, Moses, Solomon. Um, there's Elijah going up to heaven in the fiery chariot. There was a little girl in here one day and she said to her mother, her grandmother, she said, who's the old gentleman in the wheelchair with the roll of toilet paper coming out the back. <laughs> that, that's what she saw. That's what she saw. Okay. Um, along the bottom windows over here are the, the Beatitudes, the good attitudes that Jesus preached in the Sermon on the Mount. Up top are all the way around and all the way back this way are the 20 mysteries of the rosary. The apostles are up top as well, on either side. Um, we put Judas, in, Judas is up there. We, we put him up there because the early church chose to list him among the 12 apostles, which he was. So we, we didn't want to, him to feel left out. He might sue us in this day and age. Um, across the bottom of the Ten Commandments, and and then across the bottom over here are all the saints of the church. Now, just from where you're at, up top, I have the book of Revelation. The church comes to an octagon at the top. It is the symbol of infinity. Uh, the book of Revelation says that around the throne of God, there was an infinite, no a vast number of angels impossible to count. It also says there was four living creatures around the throne of God a bull, a lion, an eagle, and a man. And then it says there was 24 elders, two twelves. 12 for the 12 tribes, and 12 for the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And all of them together were saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, and holy is the Lamb. And then in the front of the altar, there's a lamb sitting on a book with seven seals the book of Revelation. And when the seals are opened, it reveals the future of the world. Uh, ladies, you might find this interesting. There are 12, I'm uh, trying to show you where there's one. Those of you who can see from that side, you see that little blue shield over there behind the pillar? Yes. And there's another one over there. And they're around the church, there are, there's 12 of them all together. On each of those, there's a coat of arms for one of the 12 apostles and one of the tribes of Israel, okay? So the 24 elders around the throne of God. All of those are the colors of the birth stones. You probably thought the birth stones was something you made up. Uh, Moses' brother Aaron, the priest, wore a breastplate with the 12 birth stones on it for the 12 tribes of Israel. So that's where that comes from. So we are the Old and New Testament together. So we have the 12 apostles and the 12 um, tribes of Israel. And then if you look at the metal plates up top are the four living creatures. There's an eagle on that one, a man, a bull, and overhead a lion. And they, rep they represent the attributes of God. That God is all strong, the bull, all swift, the eagle, all wise, the man, and all the lion, all noble. So the 24 elders, the four living creatures, and then at the very top, uh, there's eight big angels. And anyway, so all of them together are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. He was, he is, he is to come, the Almighty. 
And what do we do at the end of the preface in Mass? We on earth say, holy, holy is the Lord God. Okay. Her question is, there's a piece of Latin on the ground. Um, hinc, uh, hinc humiliabus venia, hinc retributio superbus. Uh, here, the humble are fed. Here, retribution for the proud. So I found that in a church in Chicago, a copy of it, St. John Cantius, and it's also in the church in Rome. Here, the humble are fed, the Eucharist, here the humble are fed, here retribution for the proud. We're a tough crowd around here. <laughs> um, the, the only part I have in this whole church is it's in the Bethlehem scene, and you'll see it when you go in there. I modeled for the donkey. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay, starting with Genesis. And Genesis means the book of beginnings. Okay, um, sometimes the whole thing is in the beginning. So there's a cut up general comments about, first of all, the Bible is not a book, it's a library of books. It's the literature of the people. Uh, it didn't drop out of the heavens. And when you say the Bible is the word of God, well, it's the word of God in the words of men. I mean, it's all human language in there. There's about 46 books in the Old Testament and 29 in the New. Um, as a general rule, the, the, the Bible is kind of a young book. It's only counting in our own time. It's about uh, 3,800 years old. Little detail. And so how would a people who only lived 3,800 years ago start off their book by saying, in the beginning? They weren't there, were they? So where's this coming from? So the bottom line is the Bible is revelation. God revealed himself and taught us about himself. As, you know, we write books every day and they disappear within a week, but this one won't go away. So the first, the first uh, line of the Bible says this, oh sorry, the general rule is this, the New Testament is concealed in the Old Testament. It's hidden away in there. The Old Testament is revealed in the New. I'll give you two quick examples of it, and then I kept moving on the picture. Okay, take this one first. Everybody knows about Jonah. Jonah and the big fish, right? A little bit of biblical rap. Jonah must have been a bad man. He must have been a sinner, because when the whale got him down, he didn't like his dinner. <laughs> Now, you're a scientist, and you say, no sense here, no sense. I mean, the gullet of the whale is so tiny, no man could fit down into the belly of a fish. And furthermore, if they did get him down into the belly of the fish, he wouldn't have come out the whale's mouth after three days. He would have come out as whale turd. <laughs> so what you have to do with the Bible is, you have to not ask, did it happen? You have to say, what does it mean? What does it mean? Now watch Jesus telling us what it means. Uh, later on, people will confront Jesus and they'll say to him, give us a sign. Give us a sign. And he says to them, it is an evil and perverse generation that asks for a sign. The only sign I will give you is the sign of Jonah. Now here's Jesus segueing back 800 years. And he said, just as Jonah spent three days in the belly of the big fish, so the Son of Man must spend three days in the belly of the earth. So the story of Jonah and the big fish is pointing to Jesus rising from the dead. The whale spit Jonah out on the dry land. He went down to preaching like a righteous man. Again, the earth spit Jesus out, the resurrection. Here's another one, just in case you think I'm making this up as I go along. Um, there's an extraordinary story in the book of Numbers. And it says that the people of God, the chosen people, the dusty Hebrews, 
uh, came out of the land of Egypt. About three million, we estimate, we don't know. And they did something that people do uh, all the time. They, they, uh, they complained, they started complaining. Anybody here, you know, it's, it's the thing to do nowadays. Complain and rant about everybody, okay. Uh, so then it says in the scripture, God sent seraph serpents among the people. And, and they were sick of Moses and they were sick of the manna that they were being fed. So God sent seraph serpents among the people so that many of them died. Then Moses says, intercedes, he said, uh, save the people, save the people. Now watch this, the same God who told Moses, no graven images, he said to him, make a bronze serpent and mount it on a pole. What happened to the, um, the first commandment about no graven images? Mind your own business, make a bronze serpent and mount it on a pole. So Moses makes the bronze serpent, mounts it on the pole, and whoever looked at the bronze serpent got well. So what's all that about? Now watch again go forward 800, well, 1,200 years. A man named Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. And Jesus says to him, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up. And if I am lifted up on the cross, I will draw all mankind to myself. So he's letting us know how to interpret the scripture. Jesus did scripture that way. And there's hundreds of other examples of it. Okay, back to our picture now. Look around and see what do you see first. What do you see in the picture? You're welcome to call out if you wish. You see the binary code, yes. Did you know about that already? Interesting, okay. There's a binary code, computer speak, right under the big cloud. See, it looks like a fishing net, but it's all zeros and ones in it. Oh, good, okay. What else does anybody see? Eve. 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 Uh, the, the mother of all the living. That's what the name Eve means. And the, the guy who looks like he's on the park bench drunk, um, that's all dirt bag, Adam. <laughs> that's what it means, uh, made out of dirt. Remember on Ash Wednesday, remember that you were dust and to dust you shall return. And, and there's an aloe plant beside his elbow. And there's a whale up there of all things. And then there's a cut on Adam's side as well. And then at the very top, there's the, the sun and the moon. But in the middle of the cloud, the bright cloud, there are four Hebrew letters, Y-H-W-H. -H. They call it the Tetragrammaton, whatever that means. But the four letters, and they spell out the word Yahweh, the I am. Okay, now we'll go run down to the picture. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was a wasteland, and there was darkness upon the face of the deep. Now there's a suggestion of a second person, right immediately. And the Spirit of God moved over the darkness. First line of the Bible, God the Creator, he created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a wasteland, the Spirit moved over the darkness, and God said, the third person, the Father, the Spirit, and the Word. God said, let there be light, and the light was made. So every time you bless yourself, you're reminding yourself of the beginning. Okay, and then let there be light, and the light was made. Now the binary numbers written under the cloud are, uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was a wasteland, in binary speak. And underneath that is, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. So the future generations will probably think they invented the computer. <laughs> well, now they're no different. Um, and so then you have, there's a wound on Adam's side. Um, God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helpmate suitable to, for himself. 
And so the Lord God cast a deep sleep upon the man while he was asleep, took out one of his ribs, closed up the place with flesh, and built up into a woman the rib that he had taken from the man. Now, watch this, please. It was at three o'clock in the afternoon, and the second Adam is hanging on the cross, probably naked, probably naked. And he's suffocating to death. And to pull up on the nails, to breathe, and to pull up. <gasps> and if they weren't dying quick enough, they used to come and break their legs. Well, your body would collapse then and close in on top. So they broke the legs of the two thieves who were with Jesus. When they came to Jesus, they found he was already dead. The soldier takes a spear up under his side. Now figure out for yourself why is it that the Genesis story told us that the first Adam, his side was opened up. Here we have the second Adam, his side is opened up. Out comes blood and water. And I'm sure all of you were baptized. And blood for Holy Communion. So we're made from the side of the second Adam, Christ. Okay. Um, the aloe plant, little detail. When the Sabbath was over, the women went to the tomb in the early morning and they brought myrrh and aloes to anoint the body of Jesus. And remember Christmas time when Jesus was a baby? The three kings brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. <coughs> myrrh is a sweet smelling perfume, medicinal, and capable of embalming. So these are all prophecies pointing to Christ in the future. Um, Eve, we tried to stay away from images of God with a fellow with a big beard. Uh, so we gave Eve a lily with three, three blooms in it to stand for the Holy Trinity. Um, we protected her modesty with shadow. Um, now, there's a little bit of, uh, as to say, the dark side in myself. Look at Eve up there. Um, I, I was a, 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 a younger fella in the 60s, and the women were screaming back then. The Bible is too patriarchal. They'd never read it, but they were shouting about it. The Bible is too patriarchal. It doesn't include women, and women are mentioned from beginning to end. They never read it, but they were ranting this thing. So I decided I'd be inclusive. <laughs> so you can see that the devil up there is a big-breasted woman, and, and the hair is coming up on either side of her head like horns. And, and I gave her a gooseberry. There's no mention of an apple in the Bible, in Genesis. It says the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And the first humans were given a choice. God said to them, you can eat from all the trees of the garden, but if you touch the tree of the, tr of the knowledge of good and evil, you will most surely die. And so you know what happened. So the first humans chose darkness. Now there was a pro prophecy given, well, um, something obviously went wrong. Um, and you can see that Adam and Eve look older. Uh, they also know what shame is. They also know what fear is. And we have the angel driving them out of the garden, uh, just as you were driven out of your mother's womb. Most of the Bible is written into our own bodies. Like for instance, mother, father, child is the Trinity. Uh, you have memory, imagination, and will. And yet you're one person. You have triple powers. So, uh, so it's called the original sin. And you can see the saber tooth the tiger. Uh, so here's, here's, here's what was said then. Um, God said, Adam, where are you? Uh, after they had sinned, Adam, where are you? And he says, Adam says, I was, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. Now, God doesn't need a GPS to know where you're at. He knows every hair in your head, but we think we can hide. So, Adam, where are you? I was afraid, fear. Everybody been afraid sometime or other? 
I was afraid naked. You were probably naked this morning or sometime in the past week at least. I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself, hiding. It's a Russian collusion is what it is, I'm telling you. <laughs> We're still doing it. We just uh, some, something's wrong with us. Um, so he said, uh, "Who?" To and then he said, uh, "Who told you that you were naked?" Now watch what he does next. It was the woman you put me with, ladies. <laughs> it was the woman you put me with. And then, um, so God turned to Satan and he says to him, uh, "Because you have done this." Accursed are you beyond all the cattle and all the wild beasts. With, you shall crawl on your belly and eat dust every day of your life. Now here's the prophecy. It's so important to get this. God said to Satan, I will make you enemies of each other, you and the woman. Let it sink in. There's going to come the woman who will put things right. Her son will put things right. Uh, People are shocked a little bit when Jesus called Mary woman at the wedding feast of Cana. Woman. She is the woman. So he said, I will make you enemies of each other, you and the woman. Your offspring, Satan, and her offspring will be enemies. Now who's the offspring of the woman? Jesus. And he will crush your head as you lie in wait for his heel. Well, Jesus is the new Adam, Mary is the new Eve. And in traditional Catholic art, you will see them, uh, an image of Jesus on the cross, which is the tree of life. And who's standing beneath the cross? Cain and Abel, it's the first murder. Uh, Adam and Eve broke the first commandment, you know, you should obey God, love God. Uh, and Cain and Abel both broke the second, you should love your neighbor as yourself. Most people don't think of this, but Cain and Abel were priests. And uh, again, they were probably offered their sacrifices naked. But in deference to uh, our rather Puritan modesty and original sin, we put loincloths on them. And notice the smoke of the altar up top. The smoke is going up into the dark cloud where God dwells. And the altar nearer the front is the smoke is coming down towards the ground. All this is saying is that the sin of Adam contaminated their offspring. It's the only part of our religion I find grossly unfair. Um, Adam and Eve disobeyed God, so why do we have to suffer? It's one of those things, those mysteries. I mean, I could, I could have done sins by myself. I didn't have to inherit it, you know, type of thing. So, anyway, here we have the first murder. Now, all it says was, in due time, uh, Adam, or uh, Cain and Abel come to, came to offer due sacrifices to God. And it says, God looked with favor on Abel and on his offering. That's the fellow on the ground. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Now, people quickly ask the wrong question here. They say, how come God didn't accept uh, Cain's sacrifice? It was Cain he didn't accept. Because he had, his deeds were wicked. He had an angry heart inside of him. So, uh, to give you an example of that, if I gave you uh, a ticket today, a gift card, to, to go to your best possible restaurant, and you could eat for a week there, and as I'm handing you the gift card, I said to you, I hope to God you choke. <laughs> That's what Cain was doing. He was offering his sacrifice with an angry heart. And God sees through us, you know. So he, he looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. And then Cain killed his brother Abel, and God said to him, uh, Cain, where is your brother? Abel and he said am I my brother's keeper and God said to him your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground for revenge now later on okay one last thing first um, first mention of depression was Cain in the Bible because he had done evil stuff later on in history two other priests would face one another Caiaphas the high priest and Jesus the high priest and this is weird 
But the name Caiaphas means the depressed one, literally. So everything is paid forward all the time. And um, so your blood is blood cries out to me from the ground. Now Christ's blood will cry out from the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what the, they do. The sin of the first parents and their children spread throughout the whole world. And all we're told about it is this. It says that the wickedness of man increased upon the face of the earth and God regretted having made us. And then he decided he was going to drown everything with breath in its nose, all except for Noah and his family. Eight people in all escaped in the ark. Now more than anything else, the story of Noah's ark is a baptism story. Uh, I, I doubt if it's strict history in, this, in our sense of the word. Like the waters of the great flood made an end of sin and a new beginning of goodness. Eight people escaped in the ark. At your baptism, the original sin was broken in your life and you came out of the water like Christ rising from the dead to follow Christ for the rest of your life, hopefully to cross the final Jordan into heaven. So these are um, universal parables. Cain and Abel, uh, Adam and Eve, Noah, and they were revealed to us by God. Uh, you say, well now, are you, are you walking it back? No, when I say it's a universal parable, I mean every man should be able to look at Adam and Eve and see himself. Every woman should be able to look at Eve and understand who she is. We're getting into strict history, so turn around and look that way, please. <clears throat> Thank you. Abraham lived about uh, 1800 years before the coming of Christ, and he lived in modern day uh, Iraq, Iran area. It's not interesting. The first Jew was an Iraqi. Tell him that today, I'm sure they'd be very happy about it. But uh, he was born in that area. Um, and he, the religion of that time was the worship of the circle. Primarily it was the circle. It was, it was the, the moon goddess and they called her Nana. And Nana waxed and waned all the time. So they concluded that life was a circle and everybody is going in a circle like a rat on a wheel. And the only escape from the circle is death. That religion has continued in the East with the Hinduism of reincarnation. Life is a circle. Now this man is about 75 years old. His wife is 65. They have no children, none whatsoever and he's beginning to hear voices in his head. And, and today we call 9-11 and we'd put him in the centers and we'd lock him up in a chemical straitjacket with Haldol and different other drugs. So, and the voice says to him, Abraham, you are to be the father of a multitude of nations. And he said to him as well, I will give you land. Now, you can imagine Abraham going home that day and saying to Sarah, uh, Sarah, we're going to have a child. And like Fiddler in the Roof, she says, you're sick. Uh, go lie down. He said, no, no, no. He said, he said uh, God has spoken to me. She said, you're not well. You're just not well. Now here's the word that changed mankind's history. God says to Abraham, leave. Leave the land of the wheel. Leave the land of the circle and come into a land that I will show you. Now all of a sudden life is a pilgrimage. It's a journey, it's a straight line. Come into a land that I will show you. To show you how deeply the straight line has come into our lives, I could say to you, uh, wh what do you expect to happen to you when you die? And most of you would think, hopefully, I go to heaven. Again, it's the pilgrimage. You didn't say, I want to be reincarnated as a Brahmin bull or a serpent. So he changed our, all mankind's history. 
he set off not knowing where he was going. And you and I don't know where we're going fully either because no eye can describe heaven. He eventually had a child, eventually. And then around when the child was about 12, a new voice started in his head. The same voice said to him again, Abraham, kill me your son. You can imagine Abraham saying, my son, my son, my only son, whom I love, kill me your son. Where do you want this kill and done? Uh, on a mountain that I will show you. So it's a very pathetic story, but the boy sets off. He's carrying the wood for the sacrifice. The father is carrying the knife and the fire. And the boy is not stupid. He said, Papa, I see the knife. I see the fire. I see the wood. Where's the victim? And perhaps speaking prophetically, Abraham says to him, on the holy mountain, God will provide a victim for the sacrifice. They don't know even where the mountain is at this stage. Eventually they arrive at a mountain called Mount Moriah. And God said, this is where it's to be. Offer him up on this mountain. Then he ties him up, puts him on the wood. The fire is the oil lamp underneath. He's about to kill him when the angel of the Lord stops him and said, now I know that you trust God. Did he trust God to raise his son from the dead? I have no idea. He looks up, he sees a ram with his head caught in a thorn bush. And he offers up the ram instead of his son, uh, Isaac. Now, here's where, here's where, if you get this, you'll probably begin to understand the whole Bible in a whole new way. Um, the mountain was called Mount Moriah. 1800 years later, the same mountain was called Calvary. The Dome of the Rock is there in that area. The Muslim Dome of the Rock today. Um, and Jesus went out at the, three, at the nine o'clock in the morning carrying the wood for the sacrifice. Jesus' head was caught in a thorn bush. He was crowned with thorns. He died on the exact same mountain where Abraham was about to offer his son. And that's why the scripture says, God spared Abraham's son, but he didn't spare his own son, but gave him up for the sake of us all. Everything in the Bible is pointing to Jesus. Head crowned with thorns, the wound on his side. Okay, uh, this is easy enough. Abraham's descendants went down into the land of Egypt. Uh, 400 years of slavery probably helped to build the pyramids as slaves. Um, they were cruelly oppressed. Their children, their male children were put to death when they got too numerous. And then Moses one time, who was abandoned by his mother beside a river because she didn't want to kill him, was adopted into Pharaoh's family. So it's ironic that the savior of the Jews is being raised in the house of the enemy. Moses in the house of Pharaoh. Around the age of uh, 40, Moses came out one day, saw how badly the Hebrews were being, were being treated and had compassion. And he killed a Hebrew or a, a, an Egyptian slave driver buried his body in the sand and the word got back to, to uh, Pharaoh that Moses had killed one of his four men and so at the age of 40 or so Moses escaped from the land of Egypt he had to run for his life prophetic sign of he will eventually go back and lead the whole people out but he's running for his life at the time he married a uh, a the daughter of a pagan priest named Zifera. She went on to found the Zippo Lighter Company. I made that up. I made that up. Okay. Um, so here he goes from being a prince of Egypt to a shepherd. His father-in-law Jethro put him in charge of the sheep. 
And then around the age of 80, he got his second vocation. Uh, God said to him, I am who am. I see the misery of my people in the land of Egypt. Go down, Moses, go down to Egypt land. Tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. The Exodus. Adam and Eve came out of the garden. Cain and Abel went out from the presence of the Lord and did dwell east of Eden. Abraham came out of Iran. Moses comes out of the land of Egypt twice. He goes back. He leads them through the waters of the Red Sea. The next baptism story. The people of God go down into the, into the uh, sea on dry land. When they come out the other side, um, they are fed with manna and the Ten Commandments. And the water flows back to its normal depth and it drowns the enemies of God's people. Again, the big flood at the time of Noah was a baptism. The Exodus was also a baptism. And by baptism, you were brought into the church as well. And you were fed with the new manna, the body of Christ. And you hear the word as well as the Ten Commandments. The name Moses means, Moshe means I drew him out of the water. And they're all having a grand time dancing around the, the golden calf. Uh, God would consider them adulterous brides at that stage because he was married to the Jewish people. Remember Sunday it said, as a young man marries a virgin, so your builder will marry you. God married the Jews, but they were always committing adultery. Okay. Go to the, any question? Okay, if you make your way to the far side and then we'll go into the chapel. Okay, um, the third king of Israel was Solomon. The first was Saul, the second was David, the third was Solomon, and of course the last king of the Jews was Jesus. Written over Jesus' head in Hebrew, Latin, and Greek was the charge against him that says, Jesus the Nazarene, King of the Jews. Uh, Jesus said to the people of his own time, he says, the Queen of Sheba came from the ends of the earth to listen to the wisdom of Solomon. But you have somebody greater than Solomon here, meaning himself. This picture here, uh, John Briggs again, the uh, soldier in the picture was a character taken out of a Japanese comic book. The two women are the artist's wife. On the ground is, both of them are the same woman. Um, the, all the people standing under Solomon's uh, throne, uh, the artist went out to the Jewish families in Plan City and asked them to come and model uh, the people standing beneath Solomon's throne. The issue is two women had babies at the same time, living in the same house. Um, one of them overlaid her child in her sleep and smothered it. Accident, I'm sure. She gets up during the night and switches babies. And of course, every mother knows the smell of her child. And so the, the real mother of the child uh, said, you stole my baby. And she said, no, I did not. You overlaid it in your sleep. She had switched babies during the night. So they came fighting about the child into the presence of King Solomon, whom God had given the gift of wisdom to. And he'll give it to you as well if you want it or ask him for it. Um, so how is Solomon going to know like, um, which, woman is, which woman is the true mother? So Solomon says, uh, get me a sword, cut the living child in two, give half to one, half to the other. A very masculine solution, wouldn't you say? <laughs> However, we're not as dumb as we seem sometimes. We do know things. After all, all the men here were born of woman. <laughs> How shocking is that? <laughs> so cut, the, and then of course the real mom on the, uh, on the floor said, no, 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 give her the child. And Solomon knew then immediately that she was the mother of, of the living child. And the dead one's on the floor there, uh, behind the soldier's feet. Okay, so Solomon represents the wisdom literature. Again, this is Elijah the prophet. Um, he was an extraordinary man. He, he, um, 
Israel had gone into apostasy at the time of Solomon. Now, I'm not being smart here, but uh, there's an awful lot of the Catholic Church that's in apostasy today. It's very strange. There's bishops, and I wonder do they believe in Jesus at all? From, from, from you see what they're saying and thinking, you know. There, there's something wrong, there's something wrong. And you're all aware of the scandals inside the church. Uh, in there with, 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 the, with the blessings of some of the bishops and their cover-ups. Well, things were that bad at the time of Elijah the prophet. The king at the time was Ahab, the queen was Jezebel. And the God of Israel was, was banished and they had all the people worshipping false gods. And then this spokesman arose, Elijah, uh, to bring the people of God back to himself, back to God. And we're told that uh, he, he, um, he was a tough guy. He, what he did was he assembled all the false prophets of Queen Jezebel. Now, even today we think of Jezebel, but this one is a real Jezebel. You know, she is... B-I-T-C-H squared, you know, um, a real Jezebel. So he challenged him to a duel. He says, uh, both of us will offer a ram or a bull to God. And, and he says, but we won't burn the bull. We'll, we'll pray to God and ask him to send down fire. So here are the 400 prophets of Baal, who was a fertility god at that time. And they're praying to, to Baal, please bur send down fire to burn this bull here, you know, and they're getting no place. So Elijah starts mocking them. He says to them, you know, he, he's a God, perhaps he's asleep. Why don't you shout louder? And he said, perhaps he's relieving himself. He really mocked them big time, big time. And uh, then they were dancing on one foot and the other, cutting themselves with stones, nothing happened. Then Elijah comes next, uh, he, he pours water all over the carcass, he calls down fire from heaven, God answers with fire. And this is the part I like. Elijah got up after that and he cut the throats of the 400 prophets of Baal. And all the people of God came back to him. Now, I'm thinking, I'm only thinking this, but you know on, on uh, February 1st, you go to church and get your throat blessed with the candles? Yeah. I'm thinking of bringing back the cutting of throats. <laughs> <laughs> the only problem is I might be the first to get my throat cut. So, I, 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 yeah. um, so now, uh, what about them then, Moses and Elijah? Here's what's extraordinary. Shortly before Jesus died, like a month or so, he went up onto um, a Mount of Transfiguration. Now again, uh, Moses had, dead, had died 1,200 years earlier, Elijah 900 years earlier, and suddenly they appeared with Jesus, Moses and Elijah. Go figure. Go figure, you know. And Moses and Elijah were both taken up into heaven. Some of our, our uh, separated Protestant brothers say, if I saw there was assumption in the Bible, like, you know, I'd become a Catholic. There's no assumption in the Bible. Well, it starts actually with a man named Enoch in chapter 5 of Genesis who was taken up. He vanished because God took him. Moses was taken up. Elijah was taken up. There is assumption. And I'm not trying to destroy anybody's religion here, but... Uh, I think we should stop saying when the local mafia chief dies, he's gone to a better place. <laughs> you don't know that. We don't go to heaven. We are taken up into heaven. The only one who went to heaven was Jesus. We're taken up. It's a free gift. I'm not trying to ruin your faith there, but, you know, stop saying they've gone to heaven. You don't know that. And the scripture says that eye has not seen nor ear heard or has it entered into the hearts of men and women what God has prepared for those who love him? You can't visualize heaven. No matter what you think it is, it ain't. And I was very edified uh, recently where one of the people who wrote that book, Heaven is for Real, took it off the shelves. They said they made it up. So, 
you can't visualize heaven. It's, it's a love affair between you and God. Okay, before we move into the chapel, um, this last picture here, right here in front of you, is uh, Mary holding the child Jesus. If, if you look at it, Mary is standing on the earth, the crescent moon is under her feet, there's a serpent under her left foot, she's holding the Son of God, over her head there's a crown, and there's 12 stars up there as well, an image of a dove, and nine angels. She's the woman. She gave birth to the new Adam, and together they crushed the serpent's head. Um, the dove over her head represents the Gospel of Luke. Mary said to the angel, I'm a virgin. How can I um, be a mother? And the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, the same one who moved over the darkness of the beginning. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you, the same one who made the heavens and the earth. And then the Word took flesh. So she's the woman, the highest honor of our race. A divine mercy in the Greek style. Um, up there is the apparition, the annunciation to Joseph. At the back there's a lamb standing on a book with seven seals. Um, if you're driving into Ormond Beach, you'll, you'll see a church along the side of the road called the Church of the Dar Mission. There's a tradition in the Greek church in particular that uh, when Mary died, the apostles came back from all over the world for her burial, and then she was assumed into heaven. Uh, this one was done by a French artist, uh, Rudolf Bouguereau. Um, the original is called, is called The Song of the Angels. Uh, the original of that is in Woodlawn Cemetery in California. Um, this one was painted on an oil cloth that you use on... Remember when we were young, we had oil cloths on the tables? That one was painted on an oil tablecloth, and somebody walked in off the streets and gave it to me. <laughs> so it's called the Dormition. Now, we're going to talk about um, the pictures at the back here. So, um, you... Okay. Up top is the Grunwald crucifixion. Um, the original, if you're not able to see it, you're free to move and just to come up this if you want to. But the Grunwald, uh, it was used in the hospice of the dying. There was a disease in the middle eight, or in the 1500s called St. Anthony's Fire. It was caused by uh, a yeast infection and the body broke out into terrible sores and there was no cure for it. So the artist gave Jesus that particular disease called St. Anthony's Fire for the people suffering to be able to look at that. He also kicked against the rena renaissance of Michelangelo and all the great painters. He, he did things very different. Um, Mary is very tall, she's dressed in white. John is very tall, he's looking down on her. Magdalene is very small, lying on the ground. Uh, she, he put John the Baptist in the picture, who was already dead. And the Latin words up there, from John the Baptist, he must increase, I must decrease. But it's, Jesus is massively distorted in that picture. Okay, now, this one here was done by Peggy Watts as well. Peggy Watts is in her 80s today. Uh, and here's to the best of my knowledge. The first gospel to be written was Mark. Not Matthew, but Mark. And then after that, Matthew and Luke about 20, 30 years later. And then John around the year 90, he was more mystical. Um, Mark was like a breathless teenager. And then Jesus did this, and Jesus did this, and Jesus did this. Um, uh, Matthew was more like a, an accountant. He had a very orderly gospel. Luke was a physician, the only non-Jew writing in the Bible. Mark, who was the first gospel, has no infancy narrative. So here's what I think about it. I think this was written last, like the preface to it. It literally means the house of bread. That's important, the house of bread. It was David's city. And Jesus was laid in a manger, 
which is a feeding box. Your Italian grandmother said to you, mange, mange, eat, eat. So the house of bread, eat. And then later on, Jesus will say, take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body. And your fathers eat the manna in the desert, but they died. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. <coughs> so that's why I think it's, it's a preface, writing stuff back into it. Bethlehem is about five miles away from Jerusalem. The wood of the manger is a short distance away from the wood of the cross. Everything is connected. Um, the mighty did not show up for Jesus' birth, even though they knew about it. Herod knew about it. The priests of the temple knew about it. Uh, but they plotted his death. Isn't that strange? But the shepherds showed up. These two gentlemen and that gentleman over there are worked for the Ocala Star Banner. They modeled this for us here. Um, and what later when Jesus is, is fully grown, he will say, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So preface again. Um, when John the Baptist sees Jesus coming towards him, he'll say, look, 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 the Lamb of God. All of it pointing to a bit further on. Again, that's the daughter of Judge Musley in town. This is her child. Now, I was a bit disrespectful here. I had no choice in the matter, but that happens to be a girl child. <laughs> but it's artistic license. But we don't know that. We, we, uh, this is the one I modeled here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. um, I put in a segue back to Abraham's ram. Now, this is where it opens up over here. Um, the three kings. Again, don't run away from this stuff. Again, probably Iraqis, Iranians. And, and don't be offended, they were probably very like us who are Americans today. There were people who studied the stars, looking for signs. We've put somebody down on the moon. We're trying to find out who we are in the universe. Uh, these three men came from, from Iran, Iraq area, and then they went to Jerusalem and said, where is the newborn king of the Jews? And Herod went, went crazy when he heard about it, and so did the priests of the temple. And yet, they were expecting him for 2,000 years. And when he came, they're afraid, they're paranoid, afraid of the child. And if he only had, uh, Anyway, he didn't. So he brought him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold is a gift given to a king. So play it forward, written over his head as he's suffocating, Jesus the Nazarene, king of the Jews. This will be a crucified king who will die, who will die for love of us. The next king brought him um, myrrh. Again, remember... Uh, you know, the, the women brought mirror and aloes. Again, it's pointing forward to not alone is he king, but he'll be a victim for our sins. And then the last king brought him incense, which is a symbol of divinity, prayers going up to God. And Jesus will offer himself with his dying breath to God. Um, at the heart of Judaism, uh, and I'll be finishing with this, I think. Uh, and I have to talk about the thing up top at the back. At the heart of Judaism is Yom Kippur. Okay. Uh, the Jews are married to God, so when they broke the commandments, it was considered adultery. So the punishment for adultery was death by stoning. Remember when the priest dragged the poor woman down in front of Jesus and said, Moses said she should be killed. What do you have to say? And Jesus, uh, the same God who, who, who uh, wrote the Ten Commandments, knelt down and started doodling on the ground with his finger. And when they kept pressing him for an answer, he said, uh, the man among you who has not sinned, you can cast the first stone at her. So what they did was, every year the 12 tribes would assemble on the feast day of Yom Kippur, which means the Day of Atonement, at one meant. And then what would happen was, the priest would read from the book of the law 
from morning till night. And again, notice what happens at Mass. We read from the scripture. So he read from the book of the law, morning till night. The more he read, the more people would realize, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And they'd start saying, mea culpa, mea culpa. They knew they had broken the covenant and they also knew they, they deserved to die. So what happened next was two sheep or goats were led forward. And as the priest, I would say all of your sins and mine onto the head of the goat. Uh, we have committed adultery, we have worshipped false gods, uh, we have stolen, we have murdered, uh, we have been envious. And then the goat is led out of the temple into the desert, to the demon of the desert named Azazel. That's where the word scapegoat got into our language. Now later on, Jesus would be driven out of Jerusalem, the divine scapegoat, the Lamb of God. A second sheep or goat was led forward, life is in the blood, knowing that we deserve to die. As your priest, I would cut the lamb's throat, get the blood in the basin, um, and once a year I'd go into the Holy of Holies, only once a year. The veil in front of the Holy of Holies was 45 feet tall, 11 inches thick. When I went in, there'd be a rope around my leg and bells on my vestments, so that if I died in there, you could pull me out, literally. And then you go behind the veil and sprinkle some of the blood on the, on the Ark of the Covenant and come out and sprinkle some on the people. That's what they did every year, Yom Kippur. Um, now, watch what happens when Jesus dies on the cross. He cried out with his dying breath, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. And then it says in the scripture, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, indicating a divine hand, because no man could tear 11 inches of fabric from the top down. So the old law is finished and Jesus passed behind the veil into the heavenly sanctuary and he's expecting all of us to follow. Far lovelier. The only symbols I would point out to you here is uh, um, there's an hourglass under Jesus' feet. It's not a chalice, it's an hourglass for time now, time is running out. Uh, out from Jesus' hands on, uh, up there is the symbol of the alpha, the first letter of the Greek alphabet, and the omega is up there. So uh, Jesus is touching the beginning and the end, and you and I are in time now. Chronos is called, chronology. And then the, the thing around Jesus' head is, is called the lumen gloria, the light of glory. Uh, it's weird that Jesus considered his glorification to be his crucifixion and death and resurrection. So it's called the light of glory. With so, I'm the shepherd, you're the sheep, and it's my job to fleece the flock. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're done. Are we all done? Good. Good. Okay, God bless you.